Well, good morning, everybody. So glad to be here with you all. Man, I was, um, I was last weekend, I had to go to North Carolina to speak at this, at a, like a college retreat in the mountains. And it was, it was cool. It was a lot. I had to speak Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, Sunday morning. And it was, it was beautiful. The Lord did some really beautiful things, but it's so good to be back. And I, I um, you know, as we often do as humans, we don't often appreciate what we have until we don't have it. And then we think, oh man, I really wish I would have like taken advantage of that. And that's, that's kind of how I felt. I feel like I, I, I know how much I love y'all and I know how much I love to be with you all. But when I spent a weekend away, I'm like, oh, dude, it was great. And I hopefully, if anybody from that trip is like listening to this, you were awesome. I loved being with you. But there's nothing like being with my, my local family here. And so just thank you all for being you. Um, it's incredible to be back. And especially on today, Palm Sunday, this is amazing. We're entering into Holy Week. All the Baptists in the room were like, what week? You better watch it. No, Holy Week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're walking into Holy Week. Today's Palm Sunday. Tomorrow's Holy Monday, Holy Tuesday, Holy Wednesday, Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. If you don't know the day, just put Holy in front of it and you're set. But I will say, uh, for extra credit, does anybody know the other name for Holy Wednesday? Wait, 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 what? Spy. Jasmine, you cheated. <laughs> this is Jasmine, by the way. She's our new ministry coordinator. Could you give a what's up to her? Yeah. Yeah. You'll have, you'll have a chance in the coming weeks to meet her and have and spend some time with her, but um, thanks for answering that. Yeah, Spy Wednesday. Isn't that a weird name for it? Does anybody know why it's called Spy Wednesday? Think about, think about what happened during Holy Week and like, what do you think could have happened that would have made Wednesday be called Spy Wednesday? What did you say? Judas. Judas. Yep, that's right. It's when Judas makes his plan. And so Wednesday, if you want to celebrate Spy Wednesday, which would be weird because what Judas did was super uncool, but you can like spy on people and stuff and celebrate it that way. <laughs> but um, no, I'm just kidding. But um, no, this is, this is, Seriously, like all jokes aside, this, this week that we are entering into today, if not this week, then nothing. If not the events that transpire during this week and ultimately how it's capstoned next Sunday, nothing matters. And so don't take that lightly. As we enter into this week, don't take that lightly. D please, my prayer is that we wouldn't go about this week just like it's any other week because it's not. It's not. This is the whole reason why we do what we do, why we believe what we believe, why we gather together as brothers and sisters. It's all rooted in this week, what happens this week. And like Eric said, we're closing out Lent, which is, it's insane. I can't believe it's almost been 40 days of, of practicing Lent. And this, this year we practiced it together corporately. And um, for, for many of you, I share this um, one of the things that I was, I was giving up for Lent was the nicotine salt pouches that I was using kind of just for anxiety and nervousness and that kind of thing that I'd held on to as I'd been walking um, in recovery from drug and alcohol addiction. And, and I really felt the Lord being like, all right, it's time to hand that over. It's time to give that up. And it's been beautiful. It's been a beautiful almost 40 days of, of just being free from that and, and not relying on it, not needing it. Um, I also um, had, had committed to just I, I can binge, and I know there's people in here that can relate um, to this. I can just binge on podcasts, podcasts and lectures and debates, just constant input. And I never have a chance, really, I realized, I never had a chance to just have my own, like, original thought. And, and, and I never really even had the chance to process what I was taking in anyways. It was like that episode was over, boom, next episode, next episode, next episode, was constantly feeling it. And so Lent, I said, you know what? The only information I'm going to take in is through conversation and through the written word. I'm just going to read books. And so I, I really, like, the Lord's brought me to a place where I'm, like, coming out of Lent, I'm, like, I'm, I'm not changing anything. I'm not going back to anything. I'm, I'm going to keep this same rhythm that I've been in. And that's my prayer for us, that, that as we've observed Lent these last 40 days, that, that you're coming to a place of, as, 
as we described it, you know, stepping into that holy or that hungry place. And, and hungry not necessarily for food, it might be, but just hungry for, for anything that we often put before the Lord. And so as we've observed Lent together and we've kind of taken some of those things out, handed them over to the Lord, my prayer is that as we come out of this this coming week, that it would really set us up into just a new rhythm that we continue in, that we don't, like we said, just go back like, all right, Lent's up, back to normal. My prayer is that it's a new normal for us. Amen? Cool. All right. Well, let's get into it. Palm Sunday. We're going to open up to Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. If you've got your analog Bible, turn there. If you've got your digital Bible, scroll there. If you don't, we have it on the screen behind me. Uh, We always encourage you, if you don't have a Bible, let me know. We'd love to get you one. And um, if you do have a Bible, we'd love for you to bring it, because it's it's really important for us to learn how to just navigate the Word of God together. Um, So, We're going to be in Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 40, and we'll do 41 through 44 toward the end of the message today. Here we go. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, one of Jesus' favorite places, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down, the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Which is arguably the coolest thing that's ever been said. Um, Incredible. Man. What's going on here? We're, a lot of us are probably familiar with this story, right? We're, we're familiar with the story. We're familiar with the story of Palm Sunday. Maybe if we went to church as kids, you got little palm fronds and you had them and stuff. Um, so, so we kind of know overall like what's going on here. Jesus is entering Jerusalem um, and, and he's heading into the week where at the end he's going to be crucified and, and resurrected. But this Palm Sunday, um, Jesus is entering into Jerusalem to defeat an enemy. Jesus is entering into Jerusalem to defeat an enemy. And, and spoiler alert, it's not the enemy that most of the Jews have in mind. It's not the enemy that most of the Jewish people have in mind. And he's entering in after three years of his earthly ministry where he's performed miracles. He's, he's made the blind to see, the lame to walk. He's raised dead people back to life. These incredible teachings and, and for three years he's been doing this, and, and now he's, he's heading to this, the kind of climax of this story. And they're celebrating his arrival. Because this is what Zechariah had prophesied about 500 years before. A prophet in the Old Testament says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you. Righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey, or the offspring of a donkey. You see, when we look at this story, we know, or most of us know, that Christ is coming as Messiah. And and really what that means. Like what victory for the Messiah is going to mean. Because we have the privilege of, of having the word of God. Right? Now, now, the story's not done yet. We know he's going to return, but we, we have 
the scriptures. So we kind of know how this ends. And so when we look at this, we have the privilege of being like, well, of course Jesus is the Messiah. We know what he's going to do. It's important to understand that not a single person here knew what was about to happen. Jesus had been hinting to it. His disciples knew something weird was going to happen, but they didn't really know what. And it's important, it's important for us to know that. It's important for us to recognize that. Because when you read the story, it seems as though they know exactly who he is. They're laying down their cloaks. They're cutting down palm fronds off of palm branches that represent victory. And, and they're, they're laying them down for him to, to, to ride across. And like I said, some of his disciples and his entourage, at this point, Jesus has kind of a following. People who are starting to follow him, not just the 12 disciples, but there's other disciples and people following. Mary Magdalene is with him. There's a bunch of people who've seen Jesus do these miracles and they've, they've heard these teachings and they're like, I'm, I'm following this guy. And it's, the, the sad thing is like, we don't know who all they were. We just kind of know the 12. So he's got this crew with him. And they, like I said, they kind of know. Jesus is going to mix things up. We don't really know how, but we know that he's the Messiah. We know he's worth celebrating. But most of the people in their minds think this, that Jesus is coming to overthrow Rome, to instate Israel as the ruling nation. Most of the people in the Jewish mind think that he's coming to overthrow Rome. Because they knew what he was capable of even if they hadn't seen it because word was spreading. John 12, 17 through 18 says, Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So even if people hadn't seen what Jesus had done or they didn't really know who he was, word is spreading like wildfire. Look, this guy raised you know, have you, you know Lazarus, the, with Mary, the sister Mary Martha? Yeah, the, 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 that dude died, raised him from the dead. Okay, so people are like, whoa. Well, if anybody's going to come and overthrow Rome, it's this guy. So they're coming out to meet him, and they're laying down their cloaks and their palm fronds. But Jesus knows, listen, family, Jesus knows that he is coming for a very different enemy. A very different enemy, and he is not going to leave this city before he experiences the most torturous execution. And that leads us into verses 41 through 44 of Luke 19. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. What are we supposed to take away from this part of this story other than the fact that Jesus is seemingly ruining like a pretty nice moment? My, oh no, Devani, sweet girl. Don't feel like you need to leave. She's too cute. So like if you want to stay, stay. Um, so what are we supposed to take away from this? First off, it's important that we remember, we talk about this pretty good bit, when we read parables, and this isn't a parable, this is historic fact, this story that we're reading this morning, but when we look at parables, when we look at actual historical narratives in Scripture, it's easy for us to kind of insert ourselves into the ideal character in this story. Like, we look at this and we're like, well, I would have I known exactly who Jesus was. I would have known when he was coming. Ugh, I, don't, I hate to be that guy, but no, you wouldn't have probably. I wouldn't have, like, none of us really would have. Okay, the, 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 importance, the important way to kind of approach these stories is to go, more than likely, I'm in the position of the person who like doesn't really get it yet. 
And so when we come to it that way, and we see that, that we're, we're, we're more than likely the ones who are like, I, okay, I've heard what this guy can do. Okay, well, cool. Well, I'll invite him in, and then he'll just kind of wreck shop the way I want him to wreck shop. And so when it comes to our lives, the truth is this. The king we think we want is not the king we need. And the king we actually need becomes the king we want. We'll explain this in a minute. The king we think we want is not the king we need. but The king we actually need becomes the king we want. That first part, the king we think we want is not the king we need. That just simply means our flesh is always going to lead us to an unfit king. Our fleshly, earthly desires are always going to lead us to an unfit, lowercase k, in quotations, king. See, the standard line of thinking for the vast majority of the human race is that complete and total freedom is what leads to complete and total happiness. We have this idea that complete and total freedom, I can do whatever I want, I can say whatever I want, I'm my own boss. Camille talked about it last Sunday, kind of with the rise of entrepreneurship, which isn't a bad thing, but, but it comes, a lot of times it can come from this place of like, I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I don't want any boundaries, I don't want rules. I want complete and total freedom, and that's gonna bring me complete and total happiness, but it's a lie. It's a lie. It doesn't take long to realize that this leads to a life of chaos and a lack of direction and clarity and purpose. I have a question, and I actually want answers, so speak up. If I were to allow my kids, we have five daughters, ranging from two to almost 13. Notice, Nellie, I didn't say 12. Almost 13. Okay. We have five of them. If I were to just say, hey, girls, your mom and I heading out for the day, do whatever you want. What would they do? Call out some things. Write on the walls. 100%. They do that now. (laughs) They do that now. Dude, so much candy. Sugar overload. Eddie, what would you do? Eddie is one of my daughters, so tell me, what would you do? Yeah, watch TV till your brain just melts, right? Play Fortnite, like just all the things, right? They, they'd be doing just, it would be like Lord of the Flies. We'd come home, they'd have like belts tied to their head and peanut butter on there. They'd be like, like savages, right? It'd be insane. And I see this every night at dinner. We, we our, our two-year-old, Alea, is so stinking cute. But all dinner, I don't even engage in conversation. All dinner, I'm just like, Alea, sit down, sit down. Don't stand on the bench. Sit down. You have to sit down when you eat. Alea, sit down. Good job. Okay, sit down. All dinner. It, that's annoying, me doing that, but that's literally what, I'm not exaggerating. All dinner, it's that. And, and all dinner, she just, she doesn't want any boundaries, dude. She's like, dude, I can stand and eat ravioli if I want to stand and eat ravioli. But what happens is, what do you think happens? She falls. She takes one wrong step, steps off the bench. She's down, and everything in me, parents, holler if you hear me, it's hard for me to have compassion in that moment. It's hard for me not to be like, do what I told you. And sometimes I do do that, but I also <laughs> hold her and kiss her and say, this is why daddy sets boundaries. This is why we have rules. It's, it's, it's not to, to oppress you. It's because I know that without them, you're going you're gonna to misstep. Even with them, you're going to misstep. See, kids, they don't realize this, but kids, spoiler alert, you don't think you want boundaries, you don't think you want rules, but you do. You actually do. We all do. Because they provide us with a feeling of safety and security. Someone cares because they're setting these things for me because they don't want me to get hurt. And so, so it's counterintuitive to our kind of sinful human thought of complete and total freedom means complete and total happiness, but it's, it's what's true. Boundaries, security, we need them. 1 Corinthians 10, 23, Paul writes, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. 
I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. And this seems like the clearest bit of common sense, but it honestly is one of the most difficult truths to actually live by and stay committed to. Because we think that the king that we're looking for We think that the king that we're looking for is going to operate exactly how we desire. To see our desires satisfied and our issues resolved, the king we're searching for is going to do it kind of exactly as we say and as we expect. And as a result, this is why the kings that we typically chase after look exactly like us. If we're really honest with ourselves, oftentimes the king that we're following just is looks exactly like us. The reflection in the mirror sounds like us, looks like us. And as a result, we get rejection in the garden. We get rejection in the wilderness as as Israel is wandering in the wilderness and they want to go back to a king that's enslaved them because they don't understand what what the real king is doing with them then. We see rejection all throughout Israel's story. And we see rejection all through our own stories. You see, our own striving is constantly ushering in more pain and sadness. Our own striving and attempt to earn something and chase after kings that we define it brings in more pain and frustration and sadness and torment. And Luke 19.42, man, this is haunting when Jesus says this. As he looks over Jerusalem, and don't forget, it says he wept. He's weeping as he's saying this. He says, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. Listen, not everything in in scriptures is prescriptive, meaning for all people, for all time. Some things are descriptive, historical accounts. Um, But this is one that I I truly believe is a prescriptive moment. Jesus is speaking over Jerusalem. But he is also kind of in this moment breaking the fourth wall and looking directly into camera. And so, so when you read this, picture Jesus looking into your eyes and saying this. If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. We chase after so many finite things, thinking that they're going to rescue us, that they're going to satisfy us. And as a result, we have have broken relationships, broken marriages, broken views of our identity, broken spirits, broken bodies, broken brains, broken hearts. And we keep running to other lowercase k kings to mend our wounds, but they can't do it. They can't do it. All the while, Christ is before us, and he's not just offering us, uh, offering us peace. He is the very definition of peace. He's offering us himself. Eugene Peterson has a beautiful quote in his book, The Long Obedience in the Same Direction. He said, the Christian is a person who recognizes that our real problem is not in achieving freedom, but in learning service under a better master. The Christian realizes that every relationship that excludes God becomes oppressive. Recognizing and realizing that we urgently want to live under the mastery of God. Which leads us into the second and last point. The king we actually need becomes the king we want king we actually need becomes the king we want. Meaning, when an unfit king continuously leads us into darkness, we desire what Christ offers. We get tired. In recovery, we say we get sick and tired of being sick and tired. And we eventually get to a place where we want, we desire what it is that Christ is offering. But the question is then, are we willing to lay down our lives and surrender ourselves completely to receive that? Because desiring Christ, desiring what it is that he offers, does not imply that you are then going to choose to completely surrender. It 
when I was a kid, um, I, and it, maybe some of y'all were like this, but I used to run away like a couple times a week. Anybody else like that? You'd run away like a couple times a week? Okay, you probably think like, whoa, man, your parents had it. But th- my parents didn't even know I was gone most of the time because was, I was only gone for like three or four minutes. But like what I'd do, man, is like I'd be, I'd be mad because rules that they set about or something happened or, you know, I had got like punished because I made a bad choice or I couldn't listen to my Bone Thugs and Harmony cassette tape. And, and so, you know, they, and, and so I'm like, I'm on the floor with my, my backpack and I'm loading up the essentials, dude. I got fruit by the foot. I got, I got high C ecto cooler the, with the slimer on it, if you remember that. And, and, and I've got um, my Pee Wee Herman pull string doll. And then I've got a talk boy. The talk boy. Everybody, anybody have a talk boy from Home Alone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, in case I needed to like record any secret conversations or whatever. And so I'd get all this stuff together. I'd get on my bike and I'd ride down the alley. There was an alley like behind her house and then right beside her house. And I'm riding down the alley and I'm singing, you know, see you at the crossroads, you don't belong here. I'm singing Bone Thugs. And I'm like, man, they're, they're going to learn today, right? And then I get a couple streets over and I stop and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking. And I'm like, man, this is it, dude. This is the good life. <laughs> Freedom and I'm eating this fruit by the foot. And then after some time goes by, man, I start thinking. I'm like, man, this is lonely. I feel really isolated. And every single time that I ran away, which was seriously like a couple times a week, it would end with me zooming back home and just grabbing my mom or my dad, hugging them, and like, I'll obey any rule you, any rule you set. I'll obey it forever. And then it would change like a couple minutes later. But in that moment, I just, man, I just, it sent me right back to them. Why? And I'm sure a lot of us have, we can kind of connect with that. I, I, I realized that I both needed and wanted their leadership. And like I said, that would change soon after the decision to come back or maybe the next day because that's the human condition. But I would realize that. I thought what I needed was for me to just be able to call my own shots. But all I ended up with was just feeling isolated feeling full of shame and guilt, things that are not of God. And it would send me running back. Again, that 43 and 44, it's a heavy passage, but he says, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. You see, in this moment, Jesus is referencing the coming destruction of the temple in about 70 AD by Rome. And he's saying, you all are going to continue chasing after political, military, social victory in the way that you see it and in the way that you want it. And as a result, you're going to be destroyed. You're going to be destroyed. And Jesus is there weeping over the city and weeping over us, offering a perfect and lasting peace that so many of us and so many of them at the time, they just refused to acknowledge or even recognize. And through the early years, we see the church exploding with growth because people start to wake up to the fact that their ideas of flourishing and success and happiness and peace and joy and freedom are not actually healthy, nor are they attainable. It's not God's design. And so we see the early church booming in numbers because they start to realize, oh, this is what Jesus was talking about. Eventually, they realize that no amount of amount of fleshly satisfaction is going to lead to true peace and the same is true for us and when this happens we we do typically one of two things we either continue running deeper into darkness chasing after genuine long-lasting satisfaction or we surrender to christ as king there's not really any in between and in fact i want to say that a little bit more boldly there is no in between We're either surrendering to darkness or we're surrendering to Christ. There's no in between. 
And once this surrender happens, we see that the way victory is realized is completely counterintuitive to what we would expect to see from a king. Initially, it's not the way that we would have ever imagined experiencing peace or joy, but eventually it becomes the only possible way for us to experience those things. You see, the enemy Jesus was coming to slay was not Rome. The enemy Jesus was coming to slay was not Rome, it was sin and death. Sin and death were the enemies that Christ was coming to slay and have victory over. He does not see our enemies as we see them. In fact, his word tells us that our enemies aren't even of flesh and blood. They're spiritual kingdoms, principalities, things that we often can't even see. And so as we learn that, we begin finding this beautifully unexpected freedom in walking in the way of Jesus and the simple life of just walking in the way of Christ. As we close out, I got one more quote from our buddy Eugene Peterson. He says, as Psalm 123 praised the transition from oppression, kicked in the teeth by complacent rich men, to freedom, awaiting your word of mercy, to a new servitude, like servants alert to their master's commands. It puts us in the way of learning how to use our freedom most appropriately under the lordship of a merciful God. The consequences are all positive. I have never yet heard a servant Christian complain of the oppressiveness of his servitude. I have never yet heard a servant Christian rail against the restrictions of her service. A servant Christian is the freest person on earth. You guys can come up, Eric. Family, as we grow in Christ's likeness, we no longer allow the tethers of fleshly desire for selfish ambition or for vengeance, for retribution, for sexual objectification, for praise from others. Whatever it is that's holding us down, when we grow in Christ's likeness, those tethers start to get broken, those chains get broken. And we start to experience that freedom that only Christ can offer. So our our bitterness and our resentment and our, our, our fleshly passions don't control us anymore. They don't control us anymore. And so the question this morning is this, as we close out the season of Lent, as we enter into Holy Week, it's incredibly simple, and, and, and hopefully the Lord used these last almost 40 days to help us better under, under, answer this question, but it's simple. Who or what is your king? Who or what is your king? If the answer isn't Christ for you, thanks for being honest, and we're glad that you're here. And we want you to press into that. And I I just have a follow-up question for you. Um, What are the results that you're getting? If the king that you know that you're following is something other than Christ, be honest about the results that you're getting. How is it working for you? And I don't mean that like, how's that working for you? I mean, honestly, how is it working And if your answer to that, who or what is king, is Christ, if it is Christ for you, the question for you then is, are you regularly abiding in him to continue to learn from the master about what true freedom really is and what it looks like? Are you truly abiding in him? If you claim him as king, are you abiding in him? I'm gonna be up here, um, Zach, be up here, Wendy, be up here. Um, and just if you want to talk, if you want to pray, feel free. Actually, we'll be in the back. Let's do the back. Be a little more comfortable. If anybody wants to pray, they can come to the back. But I just invite you into that. If you're feeling the Holy Spirit nudging you, if you feel something kind of pushing you 
to come. Don't, don't ignore that. I implore you, don't ignore that voice. Come and find what true freedom actually is in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, Prince of Peace, Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, we are so thankful for your upside down kingdom. We, we, we love the way that you move in ways that we would never think. You operate in such opposition to human logic that it's often unexplainable. It's, it's often hard to even describe or understand. But Lord, when, when we experience that freedom, we know it's true. We know it's real. Lord, our, our heart as a church family is that every single person in this room, every single person in this community would come to know the true and genuine freedom that can only come from you. God, as we enter into Holy Week, let us not be so quick to assume that we'd be ones who knew exactly who Jesus was. Let us not be so quick to assume that we even right now know exactly who you are. Lord, humble us, bring us low as you brought yourself low. Bring us low with open hands to receive this week whatever it is that you have for us. Open our eyes to whatever it is that we're holding on to as king of our lives, if it's not you. Lord, let us just surrender those things to let go of them and to just grab onto you with all of our might. God, it's the safest, least oppressive, most free place we could ever be is in your arms. So God, we pray that for each of us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.